All right, Albert, John, it's good to be here with you guys doing week three of Good Times, New Romans. So Indeed. glad to see the two of you here, yeah. our youth people, Woo! the yeah! most powerful team here. <laughs> yeah, we try, we do our best. That's true. <laughs> so Albert, for those who maybe haven't joined us before, and John and I, this is our first week here, so can you lead us where we've been? What, what is Romans kind of about? Right, you know, as we mentioned um, in the previous two episodes, Paul has never been to mm. Rome. You know, the church in Rome was not um, established by Paul. Mm. But Paul has the mission of going to Spain, and he would love to share the gospel there. Mm. So that's why he would like to drop by Rome and also, you know, minister to the people, perhaps get some support from them. And as we also know, there were five years when Emperor Claudius expelled all the Jews away mm. from Rome. So when the Jewish Christians come back, there is a conflict between the two groups. So that's why Paul actually spent quite a lot of space right here to address the issues. Mm. All right. Yeah. So, John, what were the issues in, yeah, in chapters one and two? <laughs> well, as we start off in chapters one through two, it really, if we think of an overview of the book of Romans, the beginning of Romans is really a lot on doctrine. And in the first two chapters mm. after the greeting, uh, he's really establishing how God's wrath is on all people groups, that the Jews and the Greeks both are under God's wrath. Mm. Well, what does that mean? Well, Paul talks about that, but then in chapter three, uh, part of the focus of our conversation today, especially in verse 21, we find a shift, mm -hmm. this, this big but, but now, and going on to how God has actually established grace. So what we find today is actually really a, a privileged section of Romans because we're transitioning from God's wrath mm -hmm. to God's grace right. and how right. God has made that available. Right. Yeah. So when we start off in chapter 3, we kind of see Paul having this kind of back and forth with what he perceives might be his audience's contention or their questions to what he's already written in chapter two, which is why he kind of starts it off with, well, is there any advantage then in being a Jew? Why should I care mm. that I have this Jewish heritage? Yeah, you know, when, when I read chapter one, chapter two, and then move into chapter three, I just mm. find it fascinating. And oh, by the way, so I am using an older mm. version of the NIV, and John, you have both the NLSB and the Greek Bible. That's true. Mm -hmm. So if we have any Greek questions, yeah. we, just, we can just we go, go to you. Right? Yeah. That's a good we job. We do our best. Okay, <laughs> so um, John, can you tell us this? So chapter three, mm. Paul is addressing the Jewish Christian. Mm. Yeah. Um, so he just established that the Gentiles, they sin. Mm. But then the Jews, they also sin. Mm. Yes. So chapter 3, verse 1, and he said, what advantage, advantage then is there in being a Jew? Mm. And then chap, um, chapter 3, verse 9, he suddenly asked the same question again. So at the beginning of chapter 3, he said, yes, there are advantages. Right. And yeah. verse 9, he said, no. Yeah. Is Paul contradicting himself? Yeah, it yeah. feels kind of strange. I mean, if I'm doing a cursory reading, I'm like, okay, Paul, there's an advantage being a Jew. And then like a couple verses later, I'm confused, Paul. Why am I suddenly yeah. not at an advantage <laughs> well, anymore? I, thank you, Jess. Yeah, I appreciate, Albert, that you brought that up because, yes, for the this translation right here, we have advantage both in verse 1, both in and verse 9. But mm. in the translation you have and also in the NRSV, yep. it kind of brings up the idea that these are actually two different Greek words mm. and that the second one in verse 9 can also be translated uh, instead better off, mm. uh, which I think uh, can be helpful when we think about this idea of well, in verses 1 to 2, what is it that made them have an advantage? Well, mm. verse 2, yeah. uh, Paul says that the Jews have been entrusted with the very words mm. of God, that the advantage they had was the Hebrew Scriptures right. and this history with God. But mm -hmm. what has left them not being better off right. is that the Jewish people, although they were entrusted with the very words of God, were unfaithful. Mm. That verse 3 points out that if some were unfaithful, will their unfaithfulness nullify God's faithfulness? that in the midst of this life with God, right. Israel was not faithful to right. God. But that doesn't mean God wasn't faithful. God was always faithful. Right. And so when we get to verse 9, it's talking about how even though the Jews were entrusted with something, they had an advantage, they are not better off. Not at all. Hmm. Uh, I love how the translation kind of has an exclamation point mm. there. But then Paul does something special. He actually bases his argument for why they're not better off on those very Hebrew scriptures. Right, and he right. goes on to, to quote so many different Psalms, Ecclesiastes, Isaiah, between uh, verse 10 to verse 18, mm. um, which is just amazing. All these different quotations yeah. of the Old Testament. So if you were a Gentile kind of sitting in this audience, at first you might have been like, well, that's not fair. It seems like I'm mm. at a loss, like we're not 
in the same boat, but then Paul very quickly comes back, well, wait a minute, everybody is in the same boat when it comes to the impact that sin has on your life and mm. where it actually puts you in position between you and God. Yeah. You know, I really like the way Paul uh, moves from chapter mm. 1 all the way right here. So it seems like um, he's dealing with this conflict within the church. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So he just first moved and say, you know, you guys, you Gentiles, you know, just look at the history, you sin. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then he goes to the Jews and say, well, you know, we Jews, although we have the law, right. but mm -hmm. we actually do not obey the law. Now, just mm -hmm. look at us and look at our forefathers. So mm -hmm. Paul is putting both the Jews and the Gentiles together and say, we guys are actually on the same boat. Mm -hmm. We are sin. Mm -hmm. And that's why when we move to the middle, um, starting from 21, the whole idea of righteousness of God mm. is so important. Mm -hmm. And how is this righteousness given? How, how does righteousness come about, Jess? Well, in verse 22, like Paul writes and tells us that it actually comes through Jesus, that mm. our righteousness is by the work that Jesus has done. And so all of this kind of writing that he's done before where people are like, no one who seeks God, no one understands, no one does good, it's all in this context of becoming right before God. And so his argument beforehand how we're all in the same boat is because none of the things that we can do, none of the things that we pursue, none of the things that um, we try to make ourselves look before God actually has an advantage when it comes to earning righteousness. We do not get righteousness by the things we say and do. And Paul makes it clear that we fall short of the glory of God. And it's only through the work that Jesus has done and his fulfillment of the law that we now get credited to have the ability to have fulfilled the law as well. Yeah. Hey, John, I, I would like to ask you this question mm, yeah, since please, we Robert. chatted a little like bit this? before that. So this righteousness from God comes through faith in mm. Jesus Christ to mm. all who believe. Yeah. You know, we chatted a little bit about some <laughs> interesting um, translation yeah. of this phrase. Can you share with us what is that? Yeah, well, even the, the very Bible I have open right now is the NIV Study Bible. And there's mm. a little note here. You know, I love mm. in study Bibles, there's sometimes little notes. And for verse 22, it says, uh, when it talks about given through, so the translation itself says, given through faith in Jesus Christ. Right. But then the little note says, or through the faithfulness of. Mm. Um, which doesn't um, necessitate that there's not, okay, we're also having faith in Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Which is right. why, uh, I love our life. Uh, last week you mentioned how the the phrase the the term for faith pistis can also be faithfulness mm. so faith faithfulness but there's always this this not just a head knowledge also right. this action that takes place mm -hmm. and so I love that in this phrase given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe or given through faith of Jesus Christ to all faithfulness of Jesus Christ to all who believe well what would that faithfulness be of Jesus Christ? Well, mm. in verse uh, 20, I love how it says, through the law we become conscious of our sin. Mm. Because as Jess is pointing to Christ, mm -hmm. well then what does it do for Christ? That, okay, we're knowledgeable of our sin through right. the law, but if it. Jesus is without sin, then the law actually shows his sinlessness, mm. not his sinfulness. And so when I think about if we were to take it with the faithfulness of Christ Jesus, it's that he was actually the righteous one. Right. He's the one who fulfilled the law. Mm -hmm. That, as we mentioned, how we're all in the same boat. Well, Jesus isn't in that same boat. <laughs> right. that he's it's actually not. in a different boat. But <laughs> if we believe in him and we have faith in him, that he actually is going to credit us his righteousness. Mm. And so he's faithful. He is the one who is righteous. And then if we believe in him and we have faith in him, we receive, we are credited his righteousness. It's actually one of my favorite things when we have baptism conversations mm -hmm. with students and at the very end we always ask them just as a, a kind of a connecting question to make sure we're all on the same page but we always say hey years from now when you're standing before God the Father and he asks mm -hmm. you why should I let you into heaven why should you spend eternity with me we always are very curious to see what they'll say and one of the things that we always drive home at the very end is that it's just Jesus. Like you get before God and you just declare Jesus. You can't start by boasting about the things that you did or how much you went to church or read the Bible, but you claim Jesus. And it's almost like you're just like that boat over there. I'm there. I'm with him. Like just I'm in that boat with him because he did it, not yes. because I did it. Yeah, exactly. You know, a, a few weeks ago, I was talking to a, a group of people mm. um, from a very Chinese perspective. Mm. So we asked the question, you know, when, when was the gospel um, preached to us Chinese mm. in the history? So as we were going through that kind of this discussion, my heart was just full of gratefulness. Mm. You know, we are so far away. If I look at the history of China and also the history of the Jewish people, 
I would like to think this way. You know, from Abraham onward, if we were able to look at them from a far distance, mm. I would be here being so anxious and feeling like, uh, when are you guys going to share the gospel with us? Mm -hmm. It seems like you guys have the law, you guys have all the history, but you were not being faithful in your calling, sharing the gospel with us. Mm. So when I look at the translation right here, when we talk about um, faithfulness of Jesus Christ, a possible translation, mm. it really hit me hard. Mm. If it were not for Jesus being faithful to the missions that God has given him, mm. if it were not for his faithfulness to this earth and then die on the cross, we Chinese have no hope. Right. But then once the gospel comes to us, it also requires us mm -hmm. to put our faith in him. Mm. So that's why you know, I like both the subjective genitive and the objective genitive. I like both mm. faith in Jesus Christ and also faithfulness of Jesus Christ. Right. When I put the two together, it creates a holistic story for us. Mm. Mm. Yeah. And it's true, like that kind of like, I like that Romans drives home to this idea that it's always God who's the one seeking us and initiating this relationship with us to allow us to come into the knowledge of salvation through mm -hmm. Jesus, right? As you yeah. said, you're a Chinese person, I'm mixed a whole bunch of white <laughs> ancestral culture, like, really like it is because of the grace of jesus and the grace of god the fact that he would seek us out in the first place that we even get to have this conversation in this relationship because we're not jewish by culture we don't have the law and it was this gift that he gives us yeah to be yeah. reconciled together and so god in his providence seeks abraham mm -hmm. he does mm -hmm. abram who later becomes abraham who's mm -hmm. credited righteous by works no, no. he believed god and it was credited to him as righteousness, chapter mm -hmm. 4, verse 3. And so we get this example of Abraham. Now, why Abraham? What, who is Abraham? Why him? Why, you know, if Paul can point to anybody in the Old Testament, why Abraham as the person to illustrate the good news? So just how do you explain it in a very simple <laughs> way to the youth? Just give I us mean, a very brief idea. If I was to explain it to a teenager, when Paul, he chooses Abraham and later he gives a small reference to David, it's like he's choosing the two giants of their faith, people they massively respected. Abram, the father of, who would become the father of the many nations, their people, the tribes, all of that is their history. He's the starting point. And then you have David, their greatest king, arguably, the one who unified the nation and made them victorious. And so he picks these two people to showcase how they are not credited with righteousness based off of what they did, but hmm. the fact that they put their faith in God, essentially, what he had done for them. Yeah, so... Paul is actually picking two of the most important people mm. in the Old Testament um, just to prove a point that mm. our faith in God, you know, the faith is the ground for us to be credited mm. righteousness. Mm -hmm. You know, I did a little bit of homework, so I did oh. draw out oh, some wow, things, right? I love it. I love your art. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm really good at art, uh, seriously. Okay, so this is what I get. So in Genesis chapter 12, mm. God called Abraham when he was 75 years old. Mm. So mm. that was chapter 12. And then in 15, 15 verse 6, the right. Bible said, Abraham believed, in, um, Abraham believed the Lord and he credited it to him as, as righteous. Mm -hmm. So at this point, Abraham was still called Abraham, not Abraham mm -hmm. yet, and he was not circumcised yet. Mm -hmm. right. So that's why Paul was able to make a point which I really like, mm -hmm. is that Abraham is also the father of the uncircumcised. Mm. Circumcision did not come until um, Genesis chapter 17. Mm -hmm. I like the historical view of this. It really proved to us that Abraham's faith in God right. is all that is required, and so, so do I. So to mm -hmm. us, right? So our faith in God is the only thing that God requires of us to be righteous. Mm. Yeah. yeah, I think it's really important too, because what you're saying is like, if his righteousness was credited after the act of circumcision, then right. it could be said it was based off of his works, right? The things right. that he did, how he followed through. But Paul's exact point is the opposite of that, is that he stopped trusting in himself as doing anything that could earn the righteousness that God gives him. And instead it's, it's based solely upon upon God right and his faith that God was going to fulfill and be faithful to the promises that he had said mm -hmm. right but I, I do have a question though yeah. so if 
um, if faith is all that is required, mm. then we can simply say, oh, I believe in God, I believe in Jesus. Mm. Then I can continue with an ungodly life and I can still be safe. Is that correct? No, I think that's a great question. <laughs> I think uh, one, one thing that in Romans chapter 4 near the end that I think about is when it talks about how, how Abraham didn't waver in mm. that, in that mm. faithfulness, that... Uh, in chapter 4, verse 20, Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith, faith and gave glory to God, that he was persuaded that God had the power to do mm -hmm. what he promised, mm -hmm. that they, Abraham stayed faithful to that. And that doesn't just mean he sat there and mm -hmm. just thought about God's faithfulness. He continued to live a life that expected mm -hmm. God to right. act. Um, so that's one example. I think another example is even just through the gift of salvation that's given through Jesus, that in chapter 3, verse 25, when it talks about Christ being the sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith, mm -hmm. that we receive that atonement, we receive that gift of salvation through faith. But then again, that idea of faithfulness, well, well mm -hmm. now we have to be faithful to him. Mm -hmm. Right. As I receive a special gift from someone, mm -hmm. if I want to continue in relationship with them, I'm probably going to give a gift back. And mm -hmm. there's going to be this reciprocal uh, relationship. And we're going to continue in that relationship, giving gifts to each other. And not in like an mm -hmm. expectation that I'm earning your right. friendship, but right. that it's out of thankfulness uh, mm -hmm. for that relationship. Right. But the beautiful thing with God is that he's the one who always initiated. Mm -hmm. He's the one who offers the gift. He's the one that takes the initiative and offers mm -hmm. it freely, um, just desiring us to continue right. in relationship with Him. Yeah, I, I really like the way you put it. It is not that I have to do that no. in order to earn salvation. It is more like after I experience the grace of God, I want to mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. as an expression of my gratitude to God. Yeah. I think Abraham is a good example too, because if you've studied Genesis, you know that Abraham although it says he did not waver, he did some actions that were not necessarily in line mm -hmm. with the fulfillment. Like right. he still messed up. And yet at the same time, he's still credited with righteousness. And so similarly in our own lives, obviously we are going to fail when it comes to fulfilling the law. We are not going to fulfill that perfectly. And thankfully we don't have to. That is the work of Jesus on our behalf. We get to claim that boat, right? <laughs> like yeah. He did it, I'm in <laughs> that boat. Um, but at the same time, there is this understanding of our new position and, and um, this love that we have for God and this desire to bring his kingdom here on earth that allows us to desire maybe to have a heart to actually do good things and to fulfill the law and to be kind to those around us as part of the fulfillment of that. Yeah, chapter three and four are really deep mm. and there are so much that we can continue to discuss. But that's all the time that we have for today. Mm -hmm. um, thank you, John. Thank you, Jess. No, I wish you. we can have another two hours yeah. just <laughs> discussing that. We could. But we will come back at a later time and we yeah. will continue our discussion of the chapters following this. So thank you again for no, being here. So good that we can discuss like this. Indeed. <laughs> Thanks.